Hello, my name's Julian Savalescu. I'm the Chen Su Lan Centennial Chair in Medical Ethics at the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine. I'm also the Director of the Center for Biomedical Ethics. So I want to now cover something uh, uh, that's even more demanding than procreative uh, liberty or autonomy. And you might think that there are three principles of reproductive decision making that, that mirror the four principles of medical ethics. Not just procreative um, autonomy, but procreative beneficence, which I'll describe in a moment as not just the freedom to do as we please, but the obligation to um, bring about more well-being in the world. And thirdly, the public interest that, that may place constraints on reproduction when there is harm to others or there are uh, distributive justice concerns. I won't deal with that further in this talk. So I'm famous for this principle of procreative beneficence applied to genetic selection in reproduction. Uh, and this I articulated in, in around 2001 is the uh, principle that couples or single reproducers should select the child of the possible children they could have who is expected to have the best life uh, based on the relevant available information. So this is a stronger principle than procreative liberty or autonomy. It's saying that actually not just people should be free to choose happier, healthier children, they should. They have a moral reason to do that. They ought to do that absent other countervailing considerations. So this has proven to be very controversial. There are over a thousand citations to my initial article, nearly all of them objecting to it. So I want to explore uh, the arguments in favor of a principle of procreative beneficence and then look at the objections and discuss how this relates to um, older concepts of eugenics. But before I do that, I, I, I want to, to sort of illustrate that it, it, it's not, I think, a controversial ethical principle. Um, it's, it's more of a common sense ethical principle. And I want to look at um, some statements that have been made at the time of the Zika epidemic that um, particularly affected South America and Brazil and other countries. Um, and this is a mosquito-borne virus that if um, the fetus during pregnancy is affected, it can cause abnormalities of development, microcephaly, small head, um, and intellectual disability. So um, very bad condition, and a lot of research has gone into understanding why this occurs and how to avoid it. Public Health England and indeed the uh, National Institute of, of Health in uh, the US both advised people um, to um, wait three months after returning from countries affected by Zika before attempting to conceive a child. Now, if you wait three months before attempting to conceive, you're essentially making a, a selection decision between different possible children. So consider if you had a child immediately after returning to Zika, uh, after returning from, from Brazil, and, and the, the fetus was affected by Zika. Um, let's call that, that child Zeke um, for brevity. And that child ends up with intellectual disability. Um, if you'd waited three months, a different sperm and a different egg would have created a different individual, possibly of a, of a different um, sex. Let's call the individual Zelda. Um, so what Public Health England is saying is that you should select Zelda rather than Zeke. Now, you haven't harmed Zeke by um, not waiting. Zeke had no other option of life. And provided Zeke's life is worth living, even though he's intellectually disabled, it's not because you're benefiting Zeke. You're choosing to bring about a different individual who won't have intellectual disability um, because disability is a bad thing and intellectual disability in particular is a bad thing and we ought to avoid it if we can. So um, ethics, I think, is like physics. Um, in physics, there are vectors that um, describe the direction of different forces and they have a direction and a strength, a magnitude. And 
The way in which a ball will roll is determined by weighing these different vectors. And in, ethic, in ethics or in, in life in general, um, we also have um, vectors. They're called reasons. And we employ these every day to make different um, decisions. So for example, in deciding which car you should buy, you weigh different vectors of status, cost, and safety. Um, and the strength of those vectors will be determined by the facts, that is, you know, for example, how expensive the car is, but also facts about you, how rich you are, and also how strong your desires are. If you really, really desire a high status vehicle, um, that may affect the, the decision that you make. And repro reproduction is the same. It's about weighing different vectors. And the vector of the future well-being of the child um, is an important vector that, of course, can be outweighed by other vectors. For example, the effect on other people of the resources necessary to um, give that child, keep that child alive or, or maximise that child's well-being. So... Uh, Procreative beneficence articulates um, one particular reason that's relevant in making reproductive decisions. And uh, to give a, a more kind of uh, similar example, uh, a more relevant example, imagine that um, some substance such as choline or iodine in pregnancy in, in, improves IQ. In fact, in, in parts of the world where iodine is deficient in the diet, um, the fetus's IQ drops by 10 to 15 points, may not become um, technically or formally intellectually disabled. The IQ may drop from 110 to 95, um, which is still normal, but nonetheless it drops. And in fact, um, supplementing iodine uh, in diets around the world is the second most cost-effective um, environmental intervention uh, aimed at improving health. About a billion points, IQ points are lost each year because of iodine deficiency. So let's assume that you, know, you, you, you actually are in one of these areas, but you want to have a child now before you've had a chance to supplement iodine. Or in fact, you, know, you, you don't have choline to supplement the diet that um, let's assume improves IQ. But if you wait a month, you'll be able to replenish those stocks and your child is expected to have a high IQ. Um, you should wait a month. You ought to wait a month. And it would be wrong if you didn't wait a month, just as it would be wrong to conceive a child now if you immediately returned from Brazil during the Zika epidemic. Um, but as I've said, that would be a different child. Uh, but if you think it would be wrong, then you, you think it would be wrong not to select the child with a better prospect uh, of avoiding severe intellectual disability from Zika, or even, in this case, to have 10 to 15 uh, extra IQ points because having 10 to 15 extra IQ points is a good thing. Um, so now assume that you're having IVF to treat infertility and you produce 10 embryos and they're tested for chromosomal abnormalities um, and they don't have any chromosomal abnormalities. But now we have um, polygenic scores that can also predict um, the range of intelligence that those embryos um, may fall into and assign a probability. Um, so you should use that profile to choose the embryo that's expected to have the highest IQ because higher IQ tends to make our lives go better. Now, that's a controversial statement and I'll attempt to justify it later, um, but let's assume you have a trait that is associated with better prospects uh, in the workforce, of um, socioeconomic success, of relationship success, and so on. Um, another example might be the ability to control impulses that I'll describe after. So th this um, has formed the basis of, of programs um, from the Beijing Genetics uh, Institute that is looking at um, the genetics of intelligence by looking at extremely gifted individuals. Robert Plowman is a, uh, a, a English um, behavioral geneticist that has devoted his um, life to, to understanding the contribution of genes to IQ. And they contribute about 50% of the variance to IQ. And so far, um, 
the, the genes associated with IQ um, have, 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 well, polygenic associations have been used to uh, uh, determine about 10 to 15% of, of that IQ, which is, which is very high in, in psychology. And it's thought that about 25%, that is half of the genetic contribution, uh, will be able to be um, described by using um, polygenic associations. So uh, ex importantly, expected to have the best life doesn't mean will. People with the greatest gifts can squander them and people with significant um, disabilities can have very good lives. But uh, what we're talking about when it comes to genes is something that influences the probability that uh, a certain outcome, in this case, uh, a, better, a life with more well-being, will, will result. And even if, we're, even if those are just probabilities, even small probabilities, we should use them um, to make decisions about future children, unless there's some downside, unless there's some other vector or reason against it. And in the 2001 paper, I described uh, this idea of the wheel of fortune. So imagine that you are asked to play this um, game on television where um, there is a large wheel with, um, with a thousand points on the wheel. And, and the, 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 the numbers range from um, one to a hundred thousand um, in hundred dollar increments. And the wheel will be spun and that where the dial um, rests will describe an amount of money. And uh, you can't see the wheel, it's behind a veil and uh, the wheel is spun once and it lands on a point and that amount of money is put into box A. And uh, then uh, the assistant spins the wheel a second time and that amount of money is put into box B. So you don't know how much is in box A or box B, but you know it's somewhere between one and $100,000. And then the host says to you, which do you want, box A or box B? But the host adds, if you choose box B, um, we'll throw a dice, and if the dice comes up six, $1,000 will be taken out of box B. So which should you choose, box A or B? In, in all other respects, apart from the dice throw and the one in six chance of lo losing $1,000, um, the boxes are identical. You really don't know what they contain, how good they'll be. Um, but you should choose box A, because box B has nothing to be said in favor of it over box A and something against it, even though you expect to get $50,000 uh, from either box A or B, uh, and losing 1,000 is pretty trivial. Um, but nonetheless, unless you like losing money or you like gambling or there's some other reason to choose the, the, the gamble, you should choose box A. And that's like a polygenic test for IQ. It may be that a huge number of other factors will determine how good that child's future life is, but uh, unless you, you have some information about those factors, you should choose the embryo that has, uh, on the basic information you have available, the, the higher chance of a better life. And that means a higher chance of IQ. This is a form of what's sometimes called decision theoretic consequentialism of um, maximizing the expected utility of your choices. Uh, so behavioral genetics is the field um, of genetics that looks not at diseases, um, but at a whole range of uh, behavioral traits that human beings have that have genetic contributions. And, and these are some of the areas that people have investigated. For example, homosexuality uh, or same-sex behavior has a genetic contribution. There is a, a polygenic score that predicts a higher likelihood of same-sex behavior described in Nature Human Behavior recently. But importantly, um, that score also predicts um, higher levels of um, risk taking, higher levels of openness to experience, higher levels of charisma, uh, and so on, and other factors. And, and this illustrates a feature of genetics that's sometimes described as pleiotropy, the multiple effects of genes, particularly polygenic traits. Um, another example is there are 
uh, polygenic scores for high levels of intelligence, but they're also associated with high levels of autism spectrum disorder. So these polygenic traits are pleiotropic. One of the objections to procreative beneficence and selecting once we go outside of disease, where you know, there's widespread agreement on, on its badness, is that we don't know what a good life is. There's great disagreement. And indeed, philosophers have um, argued about what constitutes well-being for over uh, thousand, thousands of years. And there are, in philosophical terms, three major theories. Hedonistic theories, what's good in life is um, pleasure and the absence of pain. Desire fulfillment theories, what's good is satisfying your desires or preferences. Economics is a form of desire fulfillment theory. And objective list theories that say that human beings are uh, animals and that certain um, activities and traits are good for them um, just in virtue of their nature. For example, curiosity, gaining knowledge, personal relationships, social relationships, family relationships, achievement, uh, etc. And um, importantly, though, it's not on any of these theories, just the absence of disease. And we're all familiar that people will trade their health um, to realize other aspects of their well-being. For example, when they climb mountains and, and risk death and, and disability in order for an achievement. Uh, so uh, we do have some idea what the good life is because that grounds our educational institutions, our social institutions, our scientific research, and we often ask advice, and indeed this is central to the education of children. We clearly do have some uh, intuitions or beliefs about what makes life good or, or best um, because our social institutions um, our, and, and scientific research are aimed at you know, conditions that promote this. We have services to enable people to have better lives. We ask people's advice. And of course, the education of children requires some conception of, of good and bad and uh, what will make for a better life. One way of thinking about well-being is to link it to the concepts of capability and disability. A disability uh, I've described is a state of a person, their psychology or biology, that uh, decreases the probability of achieving a good life in a given social or natural circumstance. Disease is a kind of disability, but so is blindness, deafness, uh, intellectual disability, paralysis. Um, even though people with disabilities can have very good lives, um, they represent obstacles even uh, under conditions of, of justice. For example, deaf people can't hear auditory warnings uh, or you know, natural events that represent threat. They can't experience music. Capabilities are the opposite of disabilities. They're states of the person that increase the probability of achieving a good life, such as high levels of intelligence. So we have a moral obligation to promote well-being through increasing capabilities and reducing disabilities. Now, importantly, our biology and psychology can be a capability or a disability. For example, being short-tempered uh, or impatient can be a kind of disability. It can make it more difficult for us in the world. Uh, likewise, uh, having a good sense of humour, uh, uh, being able to uh, get on with other people, uh, being able to control impulses, delay gratification, these are traits that can be associated with, uh, with high levels of well-being in the future. So, Perhaps the best example from the literature is this idea of self-control or, or uh, impulse control or the ability to delay gratification. Uh, in the 1960s, Walter Michel conducted the famous marshmallow experiments where he put a four-year-old child in a room with one marshmallow and told the child if they didn't eat that marshmallow after he left the room, they could later have two. Now, some children immediately ate the marshmallow, so others devise strategies to, to overcome their impulses to go for the short-term reward for a, a greater long-term reward. And, and those children are able to delay gratification, had more friends, more, uh, more motivation to succeed, and better academic performance. And this trait is uh, more highly associated with university entrance than, than their actual IQ scores. And indeed, low impulse control 
um, is associated with uh, lower levels of socioeconomic success and often imprisonment. And poor impulse control, at least in some cases, is now described as attention deficit disorder. Um, sometimes these uh, traits like self-control uh, or intelligence are descri described as all purpose goods. They're good whatever your plan of life is, whether you want to be a painter, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a, a cyclist, a, a professor, a judge, a teacher. Uh, intelligence, memory, self-discipline, foresight, patience, and so on are um, useful. Uh, another way of describing these is in terms of opportunity restricting or enhancing. Um, so having four functional limbs uh, in a world without uh, bionic or artificial limbs uh, is something that increases your opportunities and enables you to exercise your autonomy. Uh, and indeed you can describe them as autonomy enhancing. We can also describe um, uh, moral uh, traits that improve um, not just the capacity for well-being in the future, but the capacity of individuals to, to be more moral. Um, and those traits will differ from human beings, psychopaths classically lacking uh, in, in um, empathy and, and often prone to um, extreme violence. 